Hello everyone and welcome back to the Association of Corporate Treasurers and our Festival of Treasury Transformation. I'm James Winston, an Associate Director for Policy and Technical. The festival's theme for today has been about transforming treasury and business models to build resilience in the face of the external factors shaping the post-COVID economy. The prior session today considered geopolitical and regulatory developments, but also mentioned the recent increase in corporate bond issuance linked to sustainability. In this session, our distinguished panel of speakers will consider in more detail the accelerating importance of ESG, environmental, social, and governance sustainability factors as businesses try to build back better. We've been asked the rhetorical question, will the phoenix rise from the ashes? And there is some evidence that companies that have strategies focused on long-term sustainability are weathering the disruption of COVID-19 better than those that do not. I will introduce our speakers individually as we progress in turn from environmental to social, then governance considerations. And then we'll widen our discussion of building back better. But first, a couple of housekeeping points. You should see a Q&A button on your screen that allows you to submit questions to the panel. I think on the app, it's at the bottom and on the web portal, it's at the top. If you do submit a question, we won't mention your name and we'll try to tackle the questions as we go along. So please don't wait until the end to send them in. This live session is being recorded and will be available to delegates on the app and web portal, along with recordings of the other festival sessions. So starting with the E of environmental, and we have registered delegates today from over 70 countries on this call. So globally, there is a significant diplomatic and legislative push to increase ambition in the lead up to the COP26 International Climate Change Summit that will be hosted by the UK next year. In June 2019, the UK became the first major economy in the world to pass laws to end its contribution to global warming by 2050. The target will require the UK to bring all greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. And for any treasurers not familiar with the term, net zero means any emissions should be balanced by schemes to offset an equivalent amount of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, such as planting trees or using technology like carbon capture and storage. In, May, uh, sorry, in March 2020, the European Commission proposed a European climate law to turn the political kit, um, commitments of climate neutrality by 2050 into a legal obligation. And last month, the United Nations launched its Race to Zero campaign urging businesses and investors to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Against this backdrop, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, Sir Roger Gifford, a senior banker at SEB and former Lord Mayor of the City of London, who joins us today in his capacity as Chair of the Green Finance Institute. Sir Roger, please can you outline the scale of the business transformation that's required to meet the environmental challenge and the net zero target? Thank you, James, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you. That's a very small question, but uh, it requires a very, uh, very elaborate answer. But let me let, let me begin by saying let's recognise that this is a global challenge that we have, but solutions like regulations will be local. And, and firstly, why do corporates have to think about green finance? Why is everybody suddenly in love with ESG and green finance? If you're a responsible company doing demonstrably responsible business, why bother with a green bond or as a few years back, a green loan? Um, the, oh, there's an additional, okay, small upfront cost of the verification. And there's the time taken to allocate and mark assets or projects as being green in the first place and the ongoing commitment. It's hassle and restriction. And the answer to that question, which I think gives, gives a reason to a lot of what we're discussing is twofold. Firstly, it's a demonstration of commitment. And I've yet to meet a company who has issued a green bond who doesn't think that it's an exercise truly worthwhile for internal motivation as much as, as the outcome. But the main part of the worth lies in the second reason that investors and banks want the product. Since 2009, there has been huge pressure on the financial community to make money more responsible, more purposeful. And banks, heavily criticized as a sector in the past 10 years, see green finance as demonstrably good finance. They've also started to adjust their internal capital weightings to reflect both physical and political risks, which means the potential for lower pricing, which would be a direct tangible benefit to a corporate. ESG risk comes in many forms from physical climate risk, well known to insurance companies, not in the past so much to banks who have a shorter time horizon, to political and transition risk, and for equities in particular, reputational risk. No one thought of auto companies as climate risk stocks, until governments decided diesel engines weren't good 
for a climate conscious future. And if the UK introduces a 70 pound or thereabouts carbon tax, who does that hit? What does that do to their cash flow and their credit risk? And how do we bankers take that into account? Extra costs for some big carbon users, not so much for others. Bankers will then truly be in the business of measuring climate risk. Institutional investors have embraced the ESG agenda and not just because they think it sounds good. And by the way, investor interest in and appetite for green finance has absolutely increased dramatically during the last four months. It's a bit obvious to point out how badly brown stocks have done in the last few months, meaning a better performance for ESG portfolios which avoid oil companies. It's in fact a much longer trend than just the last few months. It really is the case that healthy looking ESG portfolios are good for your returns as well. And with government pressure building, adding to social concerns on plastics and biodiversity and the oceans, thank you David Attenborough and the BBC Blue Planet series, and a feeling that COVID, the virus is somehow related, it's a perfect storm for the environmental agenda. Um, I also, as you, mentioned, as you mentioned, I chair this Green Finance Institute here. It was set up a year ago to look at practical ways, as we say, ruthlessly practical ways to get the transition underway here in the UK to mobilize capital into building back better. It's our first report on the energy efficiency of buildings was uh, out last month. It's a very good read. It's a government industry partnership and it exactly points the practical way to mobilizing capital into energy efficiency here in the UK. We have 40 to 50 million gas boilers heating our water in this country. Sweden does its heating by district and community heating in urban areas, ground source and heat exchange in the countryside. Why don't we? Sweden has one great advantage. It can be very cold and much colder in the winter. So heating is naturally a higher priority, but still you get my point. There's also a green finance education program launched by the Chartered Bankers Institute, which we support for all treasury and finance professionals. Please send your people on it. But a word on what is likely to be asked of treasury going forwards, because firstly, the Bank of England is due to hold stress tests for banks next year, delayed a little because of the e epidemic. That means banks will probably need more info from their corporate clients on environmental and sustainability issues in order to be prepared for the stress test challenge. No doubt this process will take time to mature, but it's good to be ready for it. Secondly, ESG strategies that manage funds are only getting more demanding. Being accused of greenwashing is not good for a company's stock price, which means that investors will, in fact, they already are asking for more clarity on the environmental strategies of the companies that they buy. Greater disclosure, greater awareness, good to be ready for that too. I might add the uh, recommendations of the TCFD proposal, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. It's a really good tool. It's not complex. And if you haven't embraced it already, I recommend every company to do so. It can be done on one side of a sheet of paper. And there's even talk of it becoming mandatory. Thirdly, supply chain integrity is becoming a hot topic with you, and I can only see it rising up the treasury agenda for us as well. Several institutions, including my own SCB, have been working to develop solutions to help our customers manage their supply chains in a better way. Take up has so far has been a bit slow, and I think some industry standardization would undoubtedly be helpful in gaining traction. But in this state of almost infinite internet information, there is no hiding place for a company that may think it's doing good, buying good, yet has a supply issue to hide including or perhaps especially in developing countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America, where so many resources and products are sourced. It doesn't help either here in the UK much either as the Leicester people are proving to the company of Boohoo. James, I think I'll stop there. There are many challenges to come um, and we can take those in the questions after. That's brilliant. Um, so, Roger, thank you. You, you only very briefly and modestly um, touched on the Green Finance Institute. Um, perhaps you'd like to just share a bit more, given that we've got an audience of, you know, over two and a half thousand corporate treasurers. Um, what is the Green Finance Institute doing to facilitate this transformation, especially for that audience, not the banks? Yes. I, in the UK, we've divided the conversation on green into two. We talk about greening finance, which is the discussion about regulation and taxonomy and what, what, what finance should look like in order to be green and how do you measure risk. And we talk about financing green, i.e. mobilizing capital into, into greener projects. And the Green Finance Institute is very firmly in the second category, moving money into, into, uh, into projects which we believe will be risk, better risk for the um, better sort of mitigated, mitigation of risk in the climate area, but also provide a commercial opportunity. And it's finding that sweet spot where you have the commercial opportunity arising that can be tough. It often needs government assistance, as we've seen with wind farms and with solar, 
which have achieved the incredible transformation in cost and efficiency that we've seen in those two areas. We're looking at uh, homes and houses, we're looking at the energy efficiency of buildings, as I mentioned. We're going to be looking at electrical charging points around the country, how to make them commercial. We will be looking at shipping and we're looking at a number of other areas too, which will come up as coalitions over the next year or two. It's a small team, some 10, 12 people so far. It's a coalition between the government and the City of London Corporation. And I, as a, as a is run by a capital markets banker, and I guess I'm another capital markets banker as its chair. So uh, we're very much focusing on the practical ways of getting money, people's money, into, uh, into better, greener projects. Indeed, as you said, um, some great practical um, examples then. Thank you for that. And actually, you mentioned very briefly the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And I, I see there's actually a question um, asking about the relevance of that for corporates, um, perhaps prompted by the principles for responsible investments. Um, so people signed up to that will have to start reporting. And indeed, just very recently, there's the new United Nations Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative to ensure globally consistent disclosures. Um, so I think it was Mark Carney who floated the idea of making climate related financial disclosures compulsory, um, which you mentioned. Yeah. Do you think this would actually help investors to make um, better informed decisions when, when assessing climate related risks or will it just be more procedure? No, I, I, I think it's the, the real work is for the company as much as for the investor or the banker, to be honest. The, the, many risks which we have previously taken on board as part of our normal credit risk, um, credit risk uh, uh, analysis, we now think of as having a climate related element. But how do you integrate the thinking around that climate related element into your whole credit procedure? And so we, we as a banker, um, SEB, are beginning to do that now. It's, it's in, we've done it for a long time in terms of obvious stocks like oil and shipping. But when it comes to the, every other stock you're dealing with, it might be supply companies, it might be retail, it might be forestry companies, and you suddenly start to look at them in terms of what could happen with climate. And you think, hmm, okay. And as I mentioned earlier, what happens if we have a much higher level of carbon tax, which is the cash flow of companies? Okay, that's a political decision rather than a physical climate decision. But these are issues which bankers haven't traditionally taken into account up until a few years ago, and which we need to do. So. Now, TCFD, I think, really helps companies to think about their own uh, energy um, profile, about their own uh, strategies. Uh, it's, as I say, it's not a complex thing. It's a few metrics and then a strategy with it. Um, and I think it helps both the company and those certainly institutions and banks looking at what, how they engage with the company and how they understand their profile better. If it goes the way that uh, I expect or one might expect, we'll see a lot more demands from banks and institutions on companies as to how they are managing their potential climate risk, both physical and political. And so, Roger, another um, word you mentioned briefly in passing was taxonomy. Um, now, given that we've got a global audience, some of them mm. will not have heard of the EU's uh, green taxonomy. Could you just explain, firstly, what is a taxonomy? What does this word mean? Um, how is it yep. relevant to corporates? And thirdly, do you expect that this will become the global standard? A, a taxonomy is a definition. How do we define green? What is dark green? What is light green? We, we, we as a bank have done some deals for some with some fantastic uh, shipping companies, which are definitely classified as light green. They're far better than dirty 3% um, sulfurous crude oil, but they're not yet the pure carbon, carbon free fuel of the future for shipping we'd love to find. How you define that dark green, light green transition is, is part of the, the, the taxonomy. Um, and the EU has taken a, a great lead in this in terms of, um, of setting out a, a set of principles that it is currently debating on. Um, in the UK, there's definite desire to, to equal those or better them or be alongside them. But when you come to some developing countries, uh, China in particular, which have very different energy profiles uh, or very different energy, energy needs and uh, restrictions, Germany is another country who one, one could talk about, then you come into a more difficult discussion about what is truly green. Is, is a little bit greener, a little bit less carbon reducing, very green or hardly green? Um, and how should we, how should banks and institutions look at that? For me, the really important thing, more important than harmonization of taxonomy the imp or harmonization of definitions, the really important thing is to read the prospectus and see what you're buying. Because the great thing about green is that you have that independent verification alongside your finance to see what's happening, to understand the real nature of the project or the company or the framework that you're buying into. So I would, I would, I, I think working on tax standard, standards and taxonomy definitions is really good. I think it's uh, even more important to know exactly what you're buying. 
or lending to. So Roger, thank you. That was very informative. And um, everyone, we heard from Sir Roger that there's an accelerating trend towards impact investing, which aims for positive environmental and social impacts from investments alongside financial return. So turning now to um, social, the S of ESG, our second speaker is Karen Bradshaw, Chief Executive of the Charity Finance Group, CFG, representing finance leaders in over 1,400 charitable social change and public benefit organizations. In January 2018, Larry Fink, the Chief Executive of BlackRock, um, wrote a letter to global business leaders declaring that companies needed to make a positive contribution to society and not just deliver profits for shareholders and that he planned to hold them to account. So um, starting with the charity finance group, um, can the charitable sector provide some useful lessons for businesses on how to achieve a positive social impact? Karen, over to you, please. Thanks, James. So of course, I join you not as a corporate treasurer, but as a chief executive of the charity, uh, working with charities domestically and internationally. Um, and our organisation, as, as James has said, has, uh, accounts for about a third of the, of the domestic sector by income. So you might expect that I believe that charities have got quite a few things right in relation to achieving positive social impact. But before I come out of the blocks as, as sounding like somebody who thinks that um, only charities can do good, I do think that the lessons can flow actually in, in both directions. And as uh, Sir Roger has said in, in, in some of the things that he has, has talked about, the drivers that have pushed charities towards the social agenda are applying equally to other parts of the sector. And, and indeed, I think actually the increasing focus for all pillars of the economy is no longer on what we do, but on why and how we do it as well. Um, it's obviously hardwired into the DNA of charities that our legal obligation is to deliver uh, prob uh, public interest and, and uh, public benefit. Um, as a sector, we've obviously grown out of, of tackling social issues. So we have our, our roots in uh, education, health, religion, relief of poverty. Um, but over the centuries, we have definitely expanded so that we're now this very wide and varied landscape of, of multiple different operating uh, models, causes, sizes of, of, of uh, organisation. And we're not so much a, a, a movement that is held together with um, exactly the same operating needs, uh, good bits and flaws, but rather one that is loosely held together by this desire to deliver social change. So absolutely, it's in our DNA. We're driven by that. Um, and to an extent, that's actually, I think, protected us from some of the challenge because we've, we've been the organisations that do good. Um, but I've seen over the last 20 years or so a real focus, not just on the end destination, but the means by which charities reach it. And when I first started my career, there was definitely much more clarity between the sectors. And I think that the this blurring of the line between the sectors is both a good thing, but it's also accelerated. Um, charities can't just be seen as the entities with a monopoly on doing good, just as we shouldn't see public services being synonymous with waste or pro private enterprise with wealth extraction. Um, and nor do I think ESG should be used as a vehicle to, if you like, wash away the sins of business. Um, so I've, I've definitely seen a shift from uh, CSR programs that are sort of overlaid on what you do to a more holistic consideration of the social impact of business in its widest sense. Charities also moved away in its, in its funding model. So it used to be very heavily reliant on government grants and philanthropy based income to a much more diversified income um, spanning trading investments, uh, contracting social investment and so on. And alongside this movement in funding model has been uh, a real increase in the pressure to be efficient and effective but also to be transparent and accountable. A further impetus I think for uh, ESG maturity if I can put it that way uh, within the sector has come from political and economic changes. So as the state has withdrawn its sort of structural financial support of, of the charity sector and money's been harder to come by then charities have had to do more with less. Uh, funders have started to look at how they can recycle their funds, how they can extract maximum value from the investments that they make. And the pressure has, ex has, has expanded beyond, if you like, uh, excluding things that run directly contrary to a mission or cause, to being embedded in every aspect of operations, whether that be CEO pay or our carbon footprint or the behavior of our staff or who we select in our supply chain. In fact, in every aspect of what we do, the why, the, hot, the, what, the, why, the what and the how, 
um, require careful consideration and balance of risk and reward. So I would argue that charities have perhaps been early leaders of ESG because they've been judged through a different lens. And our sustainability has been much more deeply connected with um, our relationship with our stakeholders um, and the trust and faith they have in our missions. But I think that that is now uh, a crossing boundaries of, of the, the sector to become embedded within all organisations. I just want to pause momentarily and say that, that charities have had to battle contradictions in, in the word charity. So we, we're expected to be small and voluntary, but to operate at scale, uh, to uh, operate without pay, uh, but to execute with skill and professionalism that comes at a price. And I, I share this because I think those inherent tensions are the tensions that all, se all sectors are going to start to face as we strive as a society to find a new normal as the relationship between the uh, sectors evolves and as the balance between values and value uh, becomes more uh, in focus. And that takes me on to my observations about the recent past. Um, during the crisis, we saw a real focus on people that had traditionally not had a platform, the lowest paid, the frontline workers, the key workers. And I think that this has prompted not just a, a reassessment for many on what they value, um, and how value is assessed, but it's also brought into sharp relief significant inequalities, whether that's for our black and minority ethnic um, communities or the disabled or those living in poverty or the school leavers that are now going to be entering a really hard um, employment marketplace. And if you then add to COVID things like the Extinction Rebellion uh, movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too, uh, what you see is an acceleration of this changing narrative good and business is no longer good and business um, and as we've seen this that charities have had to embed social value and mission in every aspect of their lives so I think all sectors are going to to be needing to consider this uh, across the whole of, of, of their operations and rethink things like extraction and consumption what is the legacy that we're going to leave what is the wider impact that we have so my final point, and perhaps a, a lesson that charities again learn early and harder than, than perhaps other sectors, is who controls or influences the decisions that we take. Um, within our sector, stakeholders have been widening, if I can put it that way. And it's been aided by social media and by a new generation of politically active citizens. Um, it's not just those who are uh, with whom we have direct contact, so it's not just our beneficiaries, those that donate to us or those who regulate us, but people that have no other tangible connection with our organisations can now influence and have a negative impact on, on the organisations that we run. And it's also no longer a, a, a strict and narrow uh, um, what the practices and, and behaviours and social footprint of our suppliers are as well. So it, this is impacting what we do how we assess impact, um, what we report and, and disclose. And I would say that the charities that do well in this space and that are resilient to this changing landscape are those who are agile. So the ones who can anticipate criticism and take steps to get ahead of the problem, um, those who have an open mind and are able to, to genuinely express where they uh, seek to understand if they have fallen short, what they can do about that. In other words, those who are genuinely striving to balance um, to strike that balance between values and value. So those who give equal consideration to why, what and how. And I think businesses experiencing these societal shifts too and will have to respond. So I thought I would possibly end my slot by uh, asking you to reflect on a few questions. What shifts need to happen in your organisations to make them more accessible to these broadening stakeholders? How do you stand up to greater uh, scrutiny, including not just what you do but those who supply you are you thinking enough about value creation and not just as about value extraction and the impact of this on your customers employees wider stakeholders and then finally are you prepared for the wider impact of disclosures so pay gaps social value the things that you may need and may have demanded from you uh, to be reported on by those who you serve and those who have an influence on an impact on your decisions i'll leave it there Karen, thank you. That That's a fascinating insight um, into the charitable sector, but also um, I loved your list at the end um, of uh, questions that treasurers can ask themselves. A lot of points that resonated with me. And in fact, you mentioned pension funds and 
Um, there was a GFI webinar um, just a couple of weeks ago where I remember hearing the slogan pensions with intentions. So this big push now as to knowing where your money, not just big pension funds, but as an individual um, with your own personal pension pot, taking a keen interest as to where you invest that. Um, I found it particularly interesting, your reference to charity transformation has gone from excluding things to embedding things. So from sort of by exception to now integrating. I think that's the trend I'm sure that we'll hear um, in a minute when we move on to the G of governance and our next speaker, um, Ines, who, who we'll come to very shortly. Um, but also you mentioned um, inequalities and I think that's such a big topic. I would like to just sort of pick up on that just a little bit more because in his keynote address to our festival, the Archbishop of Canterbury um, urged us not to let the critical, um, by which he meant the urgent, the critical hide the chronic. And he was referring to the need for recognition of systemic injustices, such as the um, Black Lives Matter campaign after the killing of George um, Floyd. Um, so I think my question, Karen, is that there's a lot of conceptual frameworks, whether it's sustainable development goals, the principles for responsible investing, I, I could go on and on. Um, but as Sir Roger said, it's all about the practical um, implementation. So Karen, how do we actually transform business mindsets and behaviours in relation to social injustices? Gosh, uh, that, <laughs> that's rather a large uh, question. How, how does one change mindsets? Well, I, I, think, I think the first thing that we have to do is recognise that this is happening, whether we want to accept that it's happening or not. So we have to have an open mindset. But I, I think also we can see it within the trends of our, of our employment, so how we attack, attract and retain talent. Um, more increasingly, when I'm interviewing people for jobs within my own organisation or helping other organisations to interview, the questions being asked are around purpose and around uh, balance. They're not around the sorts of traditional things that you may have thought about pay and reward. Um, so there is a much broader imperative for organizations to, 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 to think about these, these areas. Um, so how do you do it? I, I think you, you broaden your perspective. You start with, with what you already know you have to respond on. So you're, for in a charity context, it's the cause and the things immediately associated with it. And then you, as we would with all risk management, you expand the circle out to think of those things that have impact and to think about the likelihood of those impeding you and the likelihood of, of you being uh, not just taken down by negative actions, but how do you accelerate some positive things and really see some opportunities? Karen, thank you. Um, you. You also mentioned, of course, the, the many stakeholders with which both charities and businesses um, work, um, including the supply chains being important to, to make an assessment. Um, so that applies equally, equally to the E and the S. Um, you also mentioned um, individuals and consumers. And in that space, do you think there's a generational shift of attitudes, um, perhaps? I, I certainly think that there is an acceleration of it, but I think that that isn't just confined to the millennials. I think that all of us are starting to question the purpose and the balance in our, in our working lives. Um, but it's, I think it has been accelerated. Um, and I think that what we're seeing is, is, is are individuals that won't necessarily in our usual uh, previous considerations have an impact on us starting to do so. As, as I mentioned, social media, for example, things that would, would previously um, have, have fizzled out suddenly become um, viral. They, be, they, they take on a life of, of their own and we have much less control over that. Um, and I, so I do think it, there is a, a, a generational, but I think there's also a technological driver to this um, and an opportunity driver. So the world is much more connected. There is an ability to, to be able to be affected by things like Black Lives Matter that perhaps 10 years ago would have been seen as an American problem or an American challenge. And it's now not, we're able to see that global uh, coming together of, 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 of different societal pressures expressing themselves in our own context. Mm -hmm. now, Karen, you mentioned um, social media and actually there is a question we have, um, which will be, um, I think, covered in the next segment, which is, does this not make businesses more affected by the diktats of social media like cancel culture? How can we protect reputations? Um, so, Karen, I, I found that fascinating, your, your insights. Thank you for sharing them. 
Um, and indeed, uh, some 15 or 20 years ago, when I was a charity CFO, we used to talk about transferring business DNA into the charitable sector, which is, was exactly the phrase you used. So, so listening today, um, I, I find it great to hear there's a case for some of that DNA now to be flowing back in the other direction. Um, so thank you for that. And on that note, um, I would like to bring in our third speaker to share her experience of the governance that's needed to successfully integrate the environmental and the social factors within a corporate financial framework. So Ines Fadden de Silva is the treasurer of Tideway, a transformative sustainability project, building a 25 kilometer super sewer across London underneath the River Thames. So Ines, you, you described the project to me um, when we were talking the other day, not as a utility or sewer, but as reconnecting London with the River Thames. So um, please, can you start by explaining the ESG thinking that lies behind the project before we then move on to the treasury implications? Yes, of course. Thank you, James. So as you said, um, you know, the Tideway is building this 25 kilometer tunnel. It is a massive project construction, you know, it takes eight years to, to get it done, costs more than four billion pounds. And we could say that, and we are regulated utility. Um, we could say that what we're doing is building the tunnel, but, but from the beginning, um, it, it was never the vision of, of the company. We are created to address a sustainability issue. Wait a second, it is very dark. I move and I'll come back. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah, it's better now. As we were created to address a sustainability issue, um, it made sense to look at the impact. And the impact is that once the river is clean, what can London do with, with a clean river? And how can we help and change the relationship that uh, London has um, with, with the river? So, from very early on, there was uh, this commitment that is, as well as building the tunnel, we aim to deliver a wider legacy to boost the river economy, to increase jobs, to improve safety standards and to drive down carbon emissions. I'll give you a few examples, but there's an underlying principle here that we need a social license to operate. Um, you know, having an eight year construction project through 14 London boroughs, we bother a lot of people in the process. So we have to be incredibly mindful of all the lives we impact in uh, doing construction as well. And so we set out to create this legacy. Uh, we have 54 commitments that, uh, interestingly, a number of years later, when we decided to align them with the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, it, it was a, a relatively good fit. because so I think that the commitments were thought uh, you know, quite wide. And, and I'll give you a, a few examples. So one is, uh, uh, what we call more by river, transporting more than 90% of our materials and the spoil that we excavate by river. And by doing that, we taking off the roads of London, uh, hundreds of thousands of heavy goods vehicles movement. And London really does not need any more trucks on the road, does need more congestion, more pollution, more accidents, more anything. Um, but to do that, you know, the infrastructure didn't exist in London. We had to, we started an academy of Port of London Authority to train 300 pilots. We had to get all those barges, put all the infrastructure in place. And once we're going in four years time, that legacy will be there for London. And, uh, and I know that the, the mayor is very excited to use it for a number of, of other purposes. Another area where we spend quite a lot of time and, and from very early on is to say we have to, is how we employ people and with the people we employ. So we have ambitious targets in terms of employing women, apprentices, uh, people with convictions, people from the local communities. We said, you know, if we're working in, in, in this borough, we have to employ at least 25% of people have to come from that borough. Uh, of course, we had a little bit of trouble when we were trying to employ people in, in Zone 1 in London, because not many people live there, but um, we, 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 we try our best. Um, we also spend a lot of time in, uh, with schools, with STEM education, uh, especially in trying to bring a lot more people to construction, to engineering, and then in particular, you know, girls. Uh, and we have, if you can look at our um, video, some of the... Um, those young engineers, the, the ideas they come with and, uh, and uh, proposals they make, you know, they've been transformational for the company as well. This has been uh, really interesting. And I'll just give one final example, which is a bit of a sobering one. Mental health is, is a major issue in construction because of the way construction is, you know, people work shifts, long hours away from home, uh, 
very traditional culture. Um, the construction sector in the UK is three times the uh, national average suicide rate. And so we have um, you know, started a, you know, training a lot of mental health first aiders. We now have more mental health first aiders than we have physical first aiders. And um, we collaborate with, with a number of charities, but it's very important. And we have this massive campaign, which is just start a conversation and you just get people talking. And um, it's something, you know, from, you know, the executive to you know, people in finance, in treasury, a lot of us have been trained as, as mental health first aiders. I would stop there. I could talk about then how that translates into financing, but I, I may just pause there um, well, to that's... see where would like me to go. And that's great, and it's that, that that's a really informative overview of the ESG framework, um, but for your particular business. Um, and so, indeed, if we could get into more detail now on the practical aspects of running a corporate treasury department within an ESG framework, such as you described, um, mm -hmm. you told me beforehand that you've issued seventeen green bonds. And actually, there's a question from the audience asking you to elaborate, please, on your experience of green bond issuance. But also, can I add on, um, could you also tell us what other new forms of finance might be available in, in this space? So first of all, on issuing green bonds. Yes, that's it. So we, we set out three years ago to, to issue green financing and it came natural, given that you know, our company was created to address a sustainability issue, it only makes sense to align the financing um, with, with the company mission. And so we started issuing green bonds in 2017. You know, some of them are public, some of them are private placements and they're very small, but we've issued uh, green bonds cash with deferral, private, uh, place inflation linked, fixed rate, uh, you know, all, all types and, and formats. And, and we have 17 uh, green bonds now for one and a half billion pounds. We've also issued a, a green US private placement and more recently, we have changed our revolving credit facility is now a sustainability-linked um, revolving credit facility with a KPI that is linked to our sustainability performance, in particular, how we're doing against all these legacy commitments that, that I've talked about. Um, well, we've done, I'll, I'll come back to what other instruments are, are there, but you know, we don't, don't focus, focus just on financing because it could be, you know, all very well and good that our financing is very green and sustainable, but that there's a number of other aspects of that, that impact the treasury. And so one of them that we've spent quite a lot of time in the past 12 months is where is our cash invested? How is it invested? And we spend time speaking with money market funds and with our banks. And there's been uh, quite a lot of change in this area. And uh, there's been a few... Uh, the first few green money market funds launched last year and, and I think we'll see a lot more in this space. You know, we don't want our cash just then to be uh, used in a way that either we don't know or that we know and we're not comfortable with. Um, we've also um, sought and we obtained um, an ESG assessment um, because there's quite a lot of ESG ratings that are investor-led and they they um, unsolicited by corporate but we thought it was important to bring all this performance together and to showcase what we're doing, but importantly as well, to help with the reporting that we have to do for investors. That is a thirst for ESG data, uh, even for companies that don't issue green financing. Uh, most investors these days have uh, some very high uh, standards when it comes to ESG, as Sir Roger was uh, mentioning. Mm -hmm. And so Putting out there this ESG assessment uh, is, has been helping us with that reporting um, as well. You've asked what instruments are available. So there are, um, you know, green bonds and green bonds are, are, are very well established um, all, all over the world. But in the past couple of years, there's been a huge development in, in other areas. So in the bond space, you have social bonds as well and sustainability linked bonds. Um, and there's the new thing about transition bonds, they're still evolving. There's, there's um, a number of uh, study groups trying to develop standards for transition bonds. And transition bonds are bonds issued by companies that are transitioning their business model from brown to green. And uh, it's a very challenging area, but where most growth uh, will be because uh, you know, the companies that are already uh, very green are you know, represent a small percentage of um, I'm going to move again, see if I get the light. <laughs> well, 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 in, in I'm a, 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 a high, high, high technology. Yeah. 
Um, while, while you're adjusting, and actually that, that's fine, you look, you look, you look great that's now. Yeah. So um, that's, so that's in the bond space. But then, um, you know, the Loan Market Association has, has published a, a number of standards as well for green loans and sustainable, um, sustainable loans and sustainability linked loans. And uh, the difference here is that between, you know, the green and the social bonds or, or loans tend to be associated with the use of proceeds, that they're there to finance capital expenditure that addresses a particular, the green or social issue. But a, lot, a lot of companies don't necessarily have that immediate capital expenditure and they, they need the money for, uh, um, you know, general business purposes, but they're still pursuing sustainable objectives and that's where these sustainability uh, linked uh, either bonds or loans um, has come in in, in in the past 12 months and, and is growing. And the loan market in particular is really taking off because you know not every company has the inclination or, or the or the size to, to issue bonds uh, in the market but, um, but the loan market has been developing rapidly and there's people expanding it as talk of you know green derivatives i know a company that does everything even though the letters of credit are green as well um, so i think it comes to a point one of our bankers when we changed our um, revolving credit facility and they said it would be strange if you wouldn't coming to a point that i think will start being questioned if what we do is not sustainable rather than the other way around. Way around. And in, a, in making that assessment of sustainability, um, so, so you touched on that briefly uh, and an assessment report. And indeed, there's a, one of the questions that's come in is saying um, that companies must increasingly focus on accountability and specific metrics as opposed to yes. um, impressive rhetoric. And there's a common theme here running through from Sir Roger, Karen, to, to yourself. Um, I think what would be helpful is, can, can you just briefly, um, and, and very briefly um, on this point, just elaborate on the role of ESG in financial credit ratings and share any tips for the credit, uh, sorry, tips for the treasurers who are listening um, as to how should they approach ESG conversations with their credit rating agencies? Oh, that's, um, that's an ongoing discussion. And so I'll just mention there's a, a corporate forum on sustainable finance is a group of 25 European companies. And together we have about two thirds of the sustainable debt issued in Europe. And so we came together a couple of years ago. There's a number of um, UK members, but there's members from all over Europe. And that's one of the areas, one of our working groups is precisely on uh, ESG and credit ratings. There's another working group on ESG ratings, which are not, uh, not the same thing. All three rating agencies have started incorporating ESG in their analysis. They have different methodologies and, and, and they do it differently. It is an evolving market. I think you know, we still have a number of questions on, on how it's done and how it's applied uh, you know, in terms of methodology. There's a big discussion around what is the horizon because the horizon of sustainable company and when you look at ESG it is a medium to long term horizon and credit ratings are a short to medium term horizon and how do you reconcile both what I would say is that all three agents are very receptive to, to having the dialogue mm -hmm. and um, and I think we'll, we'll see a lot evolving in this area so um, Ines that, that's been fantastic and thank you so much for sharing. Um, if I may, I'd like to just bring in Sir Roger at this point and ask um, your opinion, Sir Roger, on this important point of assessments and how is it done um, and building yeah. off the points that Innes has just made, please. Yeah, I mean, I have to say Innes is a bit of a, a, a hero to me because she's actually put into practice what many others have been talking about and she's really made this whole this green thinking, the kind of the, 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 the sustainable thinking, a, a heart of, of all her finance as well as what the company does. Um, I always come back on this issue of ESG to what are we trying to do? And what we're trying to do is to measure risk and then find ways of managing that risk. And the risk may be reputational because you've, done, you've got a terrible way that you're behaving with your workforce or you've, you've got lousy supply chains which eat devastating rainforest somewhere, to use an extreme example. But in each of these, it's what is the risk? And, and how do I begin to measure that risk? And then what steps do I take to mitigate that risk? And for me, the whole ESG discussion is around measurement of that risk and then finding ways of either avoiding an investment in stock that's got the lousy risk there or finding good opportunities to invest in either new technologies or cleaner technologies or companies whose governance I really like because I think they're going to be very much better 
uh, holding on to their workforce or they've got a better attitude towards their foreign supply chains. And when I understand that, I brought a new element into my credit risk assessment. And it's that credit risk assessment, which at the end of the day, every financial institution might be a, okay, in a bank, it's credit risk in a, in a company, it's financial analysis, um, stock analysis. But it's that assessment of risk that is, that is crucial to whether I'm going to be doing better or worse in my investments going forwards, particularly as a banker, but also as an institution. So it isn't about ticking the box of saying ESG is great. It's about risk and managing that risk and getting, finding the instruments and possibly the opportunities that come out of that at the end. And that sounds like a very commercial way of looking at it. But actually, we found, I found, the only way to persuade people that it's really interesting subject and it's really important subject is to talk in those terms. We all want to do good. We absolutely I buy into the climate change agenda and I, and, I, and I particularly buy into the biodiversity loss agenda, which I think is going to be the next big thing coming up alongside ESG, ESG and N probably. But whilst I buy into that, if I can't show it in hard practical risk terms, then I'm, it's just a lot of hot air. So I'm very keen that the ESG is oriented around practical discussion around what is the risk and I say, as I say, it can be a multi multifaceted kind of risk, and many risks out there which we didn't previously think of as being climate or environmental risks, they now are, um, which we want to bring into our thinking, into our analysis, and I think that will make us better financial institutions. We will do better business as a result of that. I think, um, so Roger, one of the things that, of course, makes it so difficult to um, assess risk in this area is that there are many interdependencies between the components of ES and G. Um, not only in making, for example, the just social transition, which I think Karen referred to earlier um, in the face of climate change, um, so that individuals don't lose out um, at the same time we need to protect the environment, but also there, there are potential tensions between uh, value and values, and we've got a question about that, um, but also between our theme of building back better. There's actually an inherent tension between building back and better and which do you prioritize and indeed the balance between political regulation uh, voluntary codes of practice individual behaviors and again between own activity supply chain activity consumer activity um, so do you have um i'll go to innis actually with this one because innis you're actually struggling with this uh, sorry not you're not struggling but, but treasurers are struggling to to find the balance um between all these, um, it's always two sides to every coin, it seems, in this area. So, so how do you actually go about your risk management process that Sir Roger highlighted to, to find the appropriate balance? I think Sir Roger said is, is you know, it's absolutely spot on. It is, it is about risk and, and opportunity um, as well. You know, I, I think the world is changing very rapidly. And, and we were discussing the other day, there's, there's a wall of regulation coming uh, to financial institutions, to corporates, to, to everybody um, in this area. And, and rather than being chased by regulation, you know, we, we found that it's a lot better, it's a lot better to, um, to be ahead of the curve and, and do things for the right reasons. And, and right now, when you look at risk, the risk of not taking ESG into consideration in, in business strategy or, or, or in treasury it is just too big. And there's a lot of missed opportunities um, as well. And so I think it's really just becoming um, part of the business's central play. Name changes, you know, it's ESG now, it's, it's, this big umbrella of sustainability has different, you know, taxonomy, and that will evolve over time. Uh, but that, you know, the ESG is is the centre stage is um is, is something that's fundamental for for Treasury, I'd say. Mm. And Karen, in terms of the, I, I, uh, if I can chip in there, James, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's any conflict between building back and building back better. It's how you define better. And if we're looking at creating jobs and creating work and bringing people, bringing bringing re rebuilding literally, whether it's a new infrastructure or whether it's a taking care of existing existing projects there's absolutely a way to do it better which will be more future proofed and we're talking about risk either of higher energy costs or of a carbon tax coming at 75 pounds or or, or of damage to the environment which then has something which which has a consequent effect later on such as around flooding or around fire risk so the better it's just a matter of understanding the better and what is included in that rather than just quick and easy so building back quick and easy uh, that's not better 
So Karen, I, I could see you nodding there in terms of building back better. That does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. And and there's two things I'd pick up. The first first is is Innes's point about um, the the resilience. I think if you are able to anticipate and get ahead of a problem, you are more likely. Don't wait for the regulator to say you can't do something. You are more likely to be able to not just prevent the harm that, that the problem will cause, but also without being too cynical about it, capitalize on the fact that you are doing the right thing as well. So I, I think there are those, those elements around that, but also just to pick up the point that Sir Roger just made, in the earlier session, we, we heard, I think it was Eugene say that he didn't think that there would be an awful lot of, of green activity at the moment because people would go for quick and, and uh, return rather than the concept of building that better. But I think that there are um, things that are happening that are both going to accelerate the building back better agenda and have the consequence of, of green and if I give an example there was talk about the the negative impact on business the slowing of pace and the the increasing of, of risk around wet signatures in a in a lockdown scenario and yet you're seeing those uh, products that I think there's an organization called Yoti for example that's a B Corp and it's starting to to step into that space and be able to to offer something that enables you to be able to verify to the quality that you need for know your client purposes for risk management and cyber crime management and it also means that you're not expending the energy of running around the, the the world trying to get wet signatures from people that happen to be in far-flung places at the same time so i i think there are inherent tensions in trying to strike the right tone but i agree with with roger it, it's how you build back and that can and should be better. And actually there is, uh, what's the, the phrase that necessity is the mother of all invention. We are in that situation now where that invention and, and, and innovation is going to flow through. Thank you, Karen. And um, we've also got some questions, of course, about the, the role of the treasurer and Innes has already talked in, in um, brilliant detail about that, but in the context of making this a very practical session of ESG, as we've done throughout, um, for, can I ask each speaker, what would be your advice to treasurers of just one or two priority actions to take in the next few months? And we're getting near the end of the session, so so literally in less than one minute each, please. So Roger, would you like to go first, please? Yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw tried, to, tried to touch on this earlier, James, when I said there are three things coming. One is know your own company better, because you will get questions from, from bankers and others asking you what are you doing, what are your, what's your carbon profile, what's your strategy around ESG, do know that. Secondly, do have a look at TCFD. I think it's a really, uh, it's a bit of a no-brainer, um, at least be familiar with it so you know that it isn't complex and it's fairly easy to put together. Um, and, um, and, and, and thirdly, you as treasurer, you have access to more information probably than most other people in the company about what's really going on. You get a cross view of the whole company so you know what the issues are. You know where the uh, the linen is that's not completely fresh, white, and clean is kept, and you can have play a role in pointing out the potential risk of that ever coming to light, um, and how that can affect the stock share price, and how that can affect your cost of borrowing and everything else, without doing anything uh, untoward internally. Uh, thank you. And I'll turn next to Karen, please, on, on that question. So again, you, you're sort of top one or two priority actions that you think corporate treasurers should be taking in the next few months. I think probably building on the, the the last thought is around that sort of broadening out your thinking. So opening up the lens and thinking beyond the, the sort of narrow four walls of the entity that you serve and, and thinking about the, the indirect relationships, the suppliers, the public mood, the shifting power um, away from central to individual people power, if you like. I think those things are, are really important to start focusing and, and adding into risk management mix. And I need to give the final word to our actual corporate treasurer, Ennis, um, on this. Your, your top quickly, two priorities. <laughs> it's it's very much the, the same. You know, have have the discussion with the board. You know, with the executive and the board. What's the purpose of the company? How we define that purpose? How we go about it? And then take that into the treasury. What does that mean for treasury? What I'm already doing. What we should be doing. And then take the test discussion outside finance. And for us, and I've talked with other companies that have issued sustainable finance. It's been a revelation because we got so much support uh, from other uh, parts of the company and it brought finance really together with, with other areas uh, in the company. And I'll end by saying, there's a lot of help out there. You know, the ACT has quite a lot of information on its website. 
the Accounting for Sustainability Organization as a brilliant uh, in a little guide in how to issue sustainable finance um, and relatively straightforward and happy days. <laughs> as you say, happy days. Well, it's been a, a brilliant conversation uh, and it's clear from listening to, to all three of you that the importance of the ESG sustainability factors is indeed accelerating, especially for corporate treasurers as they engage with their invest, uh, investors and rating agencies to fund the recovery. Um, and we, we've heard a very clear call to action, I think, for businesses to transform themselves to meet the net zero targets. And we've also, um, a, another recurrent theme was companies are expected to become more transparent, not just in their reporting, but in their actions. And I think what really came across to me um, today is the sheer scale and urgency of the transformation, what you're describing, indeed the pace is accelerating. This is not just about efficiencies and cost reductions in, in the traditional sense that this is more like switching from a, from operating in a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional world, perhaps. Um, on that note, we started off with a mythical bird, the phoenix, and it's somewhat inevitable that I should just mention the dodo that, of course, failed to evolve in response to changes in its external environment and lacking resilient wings to fly, it became ex extinct, um, a salutary tale for us all. Um, we hope everyone has found this session informative and thank you especially to those of you who contributed questions which we've tried to, to answer all of them and cover as much ground as possible. Um, but please do continue the conversation within the virtual discussion forum in the festival app. And also, please, uh, a particular plea here, um, could we ask you just to take, um, it's only a, a few seconds um, after the call, take the time to fill in the survey immediately afterwards, because we do find this feedback um, really useful in shaping future events. But finally, on behalf of the audience, I would like to warmly thank our speakers today, Sir Roger Gifford, Karen Bradshaw, Ennis Vadden de Silva. This has been James Winston for the ACT. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>